Good morning. I want to welcome you all to worship at First Baptist Church of Middlesbrough this Sunday morning. We want to welcome especially those who may be a guest with us today, uh, whether you are here to celebrate your graduate in your family or you are joining us for the first time or maybe uh, for uh, uh, more than one time. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that everybody's here in worship today. Uh, there is a tab that's on your uh, worship folder. If you would, fill that out and tear it off and put it in the offering plate when it comes around a little bit later in the service, and that will help us have a better record of your visit with us. I want to make you aware of a couple of announcements. Uh, there will be a youth ministry team meeting this afternoon at 4.30, and they're going to be meeting in the youth room. Uh, and then uh, this evening at 6 o'clock, the youth will have their last youth encounters of the spring, and that's going to be at the Prophets. And if you're going to ride in the van, meet at 545 out in the parking lot um, for that. The Children's Committee will have a meeting on Tuesday at 5 o'clock. Uh, we have a regular Wednesday schedule. Next Sunday, there will not be any youth encounters. Um, and if the children and the youth will both note that, um, that beginning the week of June 5th, uh, we'll move to their summer schedule, and that changes up a little bit from the schedule uh, that we normally operate by. Uh, and there's some dates there for some trips. We are continuing to collect money for our global missions offering, and you will hear a little bit more about that uh, later in the service. Now as we prepare to worship, let's stand and greet each other. I know that my Redeemer lives. Let's sing this hymn together, hymn number 210 in your hymnal, and we'll stand together as we join our voices.
almighty and loving God, most gracious, most high. We come gathering into this sanctuary this morning at the end and at the beginning of life, of lives lived, of lives full of celebrations and exciting moments, of lives full of anxiety and grief and loss. God, the depth of the experiences that we have been through this past week and that we anticipate experiencing in the days ahead some con- sometimes can leave us wandering. They sometimes leave us confused, unsettled, dislocated. God, in these moments as we worship together, Relocate us in the midst of your love. Remind us that throughout the breadth and the depth of the life that we experience, there is the undergirding truth that you are alive and that you are moving and shaping and stirring in us. And then in you, we can build our lives that in you, there is hope. God, knit us closer together as we worship this morning. Draw us closer to you that we might emerge from this place changed. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Today as a church family, we mark a special occasion in the journeys of our high school seniors. We mark their graduation from high school with celebration and recognition of their many achievements and with best wishes for what lies ahead. On occasions such as this, we often speak of celebrating a milestone. And the word milestone originated in the Roman Empire when stones were used to mark places along the road for travelers. Milestones were constructed to provide a reference point along the way And they were used to reassure travelers they were on the right path, as well as to show the distance already traveled on the journey. And so it is for our journeys in life. We celebrate and remember milestones to set reference points along the way, to celebrate and remember the ways we've grown, the experiences we've had, the places we've been, and also as a reference point to look forward to the journey ahead. Graduates, as you stand at this milestone and as you journey forward, be confident in the ways that God is continuing to work in you and among you. Know that God is continuing to mold and shape who you are. And as you travel, may you have boldness to respond to challenge, openness to receive the gift of new learning, sensitivity to give respect to difference and diversity, and confidence in all you are and all you are becoming. As a church family today, it's our joy and our honor to be a part of this milestone to celebrate you. Today we celebrate you all that you are and all you are becoming. We celebrate your many achievements and your graduation from high school. We're grateful for the ways that you've been a part of this community and we look forward with eager expectation for the bright futures ahead of each one of you. As you continue on your way, know of our love and our support and our prayers for you and for your journey. And wherever your path takes you, may you always remember there's a place for you here among this community of faith. As I call your name, please come forward to receive a gift from our church family. Inside your gift, you will find the inscription who you are is God's gift to you, and who you become is God, your gift to God. May these words be your guide as you continue to walk in the light and love of God. Brandon Archer, graduate of Middle, Middlesbrough High School and will attend Center College in the fall.
Sarah Parker, also a graduate of Middlesbrough High School and will attend Georgetown College. We also have four other graduates in our church family who were unable to be here today. All graduates of Middlesbrough High School, Blake Barnett, who will attend Southeast Kentucky Community Tech and Technical College, uh, Corey Eldridge, who will attend the University of Tennessee, and Tyler Rowlett, who will also attend the uh, Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College, and Zach Osmus, who will attend Lincoln Memorial University. Congratulations, graduates, and now let us join together as we read our litany of dedication. Education and learning are vital to our Christian tradition and our Baptist mission. Biblical stories witness to wisdom and learning. Moses encountered God on the mountaintop and learned commandments for responsible living. Prophets gathered in schools in the wilderness and they learned to be open to, the discerning, to discerning the will of God for human society. We remember people young and old who sat at the feet of Jesus to learn with open hearts and seeking minds. We believe education equips people for responsible citizenship in God's creation, heralding peace, understanding, and goodwill, and seeking to better the human condition. Today we celebrate your academic achievement. We admire your persistence in study. We affirm your dreams for the future. We celebrate your curiosity and questioning and creativity in your studies. We pray that you will continue to be curious, raising questions, and using your creativity to discover meaningful answers to the issues of life and faith. We commit ourselves to join you in a life of discovery. What we learn, guided by faith, can help us in being what God calls us to be. As we have supported you and prayed for you to this point, we will continue to offer our prayers of support, encouragement, and love. Caring and loving God, you have given us hearts full of passion, and minds ripe for learning. Give, Give us the wisdom to use these gifts, both heart and mind, to grow in understanding of all you give. In faith, may we learn more about you, your creation, our community, and ourselves. Bless these students standing before us. We celebrate their accomplishments and their dream. Encourage them and us in faithful living spirit and wisdom of your way, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join our hearts and minds together as we pray uh, for these graduates. Gracious God and loving parent, how grateful we are for the ways that you continue your way of molding and shaping each of our lives. As we grow older, as we encounter new experiences, as we learn new things, you are working in us and around us and through us. We are especially grateful this morning for the ways that you are at work in the lives of our graduating seniors. As we recognize their many achievements, it's a reminder of who they have been and who they are now, and it makes us hopeful for who they are becoming as young adults. We remember your promise to each of us that you will bring us to completion that you will finish the work you've begun in our lives. And so we ask blessing on the lives of these young people. As they travel the roads of their lives, we ask, oh God, that you guide them to a deeper faith with you, speaking words of passion and energy and encouragement in their ears. Help them as they engage their questions and experiences along the way. Embolden them as they meet their world so that the work of their hands and their feet might bring your redemption to all they encounter along the way. Give each our graduates boldness in responding to challenge, openness to receive the gift of new learning, sensitivity to difference and diversity, and confidence in all they are and all they are becoming. 
God, protect them in your grace and sustain them in your spirit. We pray this blessing in the name of the one who journeys with all of us along our many roads, the risen Jesus Christ. Amen. Our children are invited to the front for children's time. children of God, right? So that works. All right. Have you ever been sick? Because I know I have. Well, when children are sick, it's great to have parents to take care of them. They make their beds on the couches so they can watch TV all day. They make them chicken noodle soup so they feel better. Well, just like kids, when adults get sick, sometimes they need people to take care of them too. So when our church gives money to the CBF offering for global missions, some of that money goes to our friend Ronnie Adams in New York City, where he has a mission to take care of some people who are sick. Those people have something called HIV AIDS, and if you've never heard of HIV AIDS, let me tell you something about it. It's not something that you can get from a handshake or a hug. It's not something that you can catch at school like the flu. So it's not something that we should be afraid of, but it's something that we should learn about so we can help others and so we can pray for those who have it. And what Ronnie does with some of the money that we give to CBS offering is he goes and visits hospitals and he takes people food when they need it and he prays for them. But most importantly, he's their friend. And just like we need a friend when we're sick to help us get better, Ronnie helps uh, people uh, Ronnie helps the people with HIV AIDS get better too. So uh, let's pray. 
Dear Jesus, we know that you tell us to take care of those who are sick, and we ask that you will bless Ronnie as he uh, has this mission in New York City and help those with HIV AIDS, and help us to take better care of people who are sick. In your name, amen. Our missions moment for today is from New York City. Milton was diagnosed with HIV at 22 years old. He nearly died from the disease and doctors told him he wouldn't live to see 30. He smiles when he admits that he hit that milestone nearly a decade ago. Milton lives in New York City and considers Ronnie Adams, one of CBS's field personnel, CBF's field personnel, to be both his friend and his pastor. It's very difficult living day by day, Milton said. Ronnie helps us get through a lot. He's helped me overcome so much. Sometimes Ronnie helps a person cope with family issues related to an HIV diagnosis. Sometimes he lends a listening ear to, or offers a word of hope. And other times he provides pastoral care to those in the hospital. Stuart remembers the first time Ronnie visited him in the hospital. Stewart's immunity was so compromised that hospital visitors had to wear protective clothing to reduce his exposure to life-threatening germs. At first, I didn't recognize Ronnie because he had the mask on, the hat on, the gloves on, but he had the Bible in his hand, Stewart recalled. Then I knew who it was. Most of Ronnie's days are spent at Metro Baptist Church, a small CBF partner congregation in the Hell's Kitchen area of Manhattan. The congregation bought its building in 1984 when Hell's Kitchen was one of the city's most difficult neighborhoods. The then pastor prayed that God would only give them the building if they could use it nonstop for community outreach. And for more than two decades, the congregation has done just that. Church members started Rauschenbusch Metro Ministries, which serves the community in many ways. There's a food pantry, a clothes closet, and English classes. Children have an after-school program called Page Turners and a day camp during the summer. Teenagers flock to the after-school teen center and numerous summer activities. And through Ronnie, the church provides pastoral care to those living with HIV AIDS. When we read the stories from the gospels, we quick, quickly learn that caring for the sick was a priority for Jesus. This is why we give to the CBF offering for global missions. Through our giving, going, and praying, we participate in God's mission. We make God's mission our passion. Please give generously to the CBF offering for global missions. Your gifts help care for the sick and minister to the needy in New York City. Your gifts spread the love of Christ around the world. You'll find mission offering envelopes at the exits, so pick one of those up. And if you'll notice our chart, our church's goal is $1,500, and we're almost there. There's nothing to say that we can't exceed our goal. Thank you. Dawn's encouraged and challenged us, and our hymn does the same. Hymn number 435, Share His Love, as we sing our hymn of stewardship together. We stand.
we come to you with happy hearts. We thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and to see our young graduating seniors with us today celebrating a new step in life. Bless them as they continue their life journey. We thank you especially for their mothers and fathers who have given them much love and attention through the years and have made many sacrifices for their goodness and health. Also, we thank you for the teachers that they had in school. They have given much of their time and energy working with young people, encouraging them to do their best. And Father, Today, we thank you for our teachers and workers and leaders with the youth in this church. They are there each Sunday and each week to teach Bible lessons, to have entertainment in their homes, and to study addition, missional friends and activities throughout the world. We thank you for them. We know that each of these graduates has a new goal in life. They have completed one. We thank you for giving them the mind that they could learn and the patience that they endured hardship and stuck to the task even when things were difficult. So we thank you for each of these people and think ahead now for our young people who are beginning a new step. We know that some will, new step will be into the business world and working. Others are planning a college degree, and still others among us, dear Lord, as you know, will be working on graduate degrees. Be with each and every one of them. Keep them close to you and may they continue to grow in your work and love. These things I ask in your name. Amen.
can't help but think that Harry Ho would have given that a, a, a vibrant amen and, a, and even a little bit of a fist pump. Why do we talk about graduation in a worship service? What does that have to do with church, marking those moments? Allison is, as usual, right on top of it. Uh, it is important for us as a family of faith, as a community of faith, it is important for us to name and to mark those milestones, those places in our lives where from that point we are different. Uh, and, and we go through those milestones, we experience those every week, uh, every year, whether we graduate or not. Uh, they come with, with having children, with celebrating marriages, with, with births, with deaths, with moving to a new place, a new job. There are all of these milestones that we mark all of the time. And one of 
the best places to share those, to talk about those, to uh, encourage those, and to lift each other up as we experience those is in the church. So that's why we, that's why we do that here. Um, I'm going to read a passage of scripture from the book of Joshua, the first nine verses of the first chapter. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon as Far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You know, graduation marks a, a point in an educational journey for an individual. And if you've made it to graduation, you've made it through a certain period of study and learning and growing. It went from 2 plus 2 equals 4 to long division to fractions and exponents to geometry and quadratic equations and even beyond. We went from the ABCs to C-Spot Run to Dr. Seuss and, and then to Judy Bloom and to diagramming sentences and reading literature and even learning other languages. We went from identifying pictures of animals to dissecting them, from banging on pots and pans to playing actual musical instruments. Every graduate has made their way through this sometimes rigorous process of learning where they have been introduced to new concepts and new ideas, had them explained and then assimilated them, those ideas into their own existing framework of understanding. And then once those ideas have been assimilated, they begin to live out of those. The same kind of journey happens with our faith. When we were children, either here in this place or somewhere else, we heard about God's love. Some of the earliest stories that we were told and the earliest attributes that we heard about God is that God loves us. Jesus loves us. Chris played it a moment ago. We heard stories from the Bible, the great stories that we hear over and over again about creation, about escape, the story of Noah's Ark, crossing the Red Sea, about overcoming huge obstacles, David and Goliath, of miracles like feeding the 5,000 and healing people who've never been able to walk, those things that Jesus did. And then as we got older, uh, we heard other stories and we began to talk about more complex and more abstract ideas. We talked about fear and hate and loneliness. We learned what grace meant and about forgiveness, and about how hard it is to practice forgiveness. And we talked about God's mysterious presence of all that we do know and all that we do not know. As we got older, we talked about people in other places on this earth, people that maybe our missionaries spend time with. 
people now that we can learn about on the internet. We talked about things like poverty and hunger and death, things that many of us may have never experienced in our own life, but others live with daily. And we talked about how our faith calls us to deal with those kinds of big, difficult issues. As we got older, we talked about other faiths, other faith systems, other different ways of believing and how we can and how we should interact with people who have different beliefs. As we got older, those things built upon each other. And as the conversation expanded and grew deeper, we all in different ways have been challenged to take these new ideas and these new concepts, these things that at once, one time were foreign but now are very real and integrate them into what we already know, what we already practice, what we already live. And then out of that, to be different, to be changed. That's a lifelong process that doesn't just end when you're 18. And, and our graduates, our teenagers are at the place in their faith formation journey where they are beginning to move, may have already begun to move from a faith that is shaped almost exclusively by their church community, by their faith community, by the community they grew up in. And the one that maintained it and kind of helped shape the norms and, and, uh, and held those together to one that is more individual and more reflective. They are moving out on their own. They're not just doing that, some of them literally moving out on their own, but, but they're also in the process of doing that with their faith. Coming to a place where the faith that they live out of and experience every day is their own. It's not what mom and daddy believe. It's not what my grandmother told me. It's not what I learned from my Sunday school teacher. I am making it my own. It is my faith. And there's some wrestling that happens as they move from that communally held, embraced uh, understanding of faith to one that is more individual and reflective. And let me pause for a minute and say that that place of transition between those two worlds can be uh, a somewhat fearful place uh, for parents, for sometimes ministers, for sometimes people in a community. There's often a desire to pull those individuals back when we start to sense that they are experiencing something that, that we are not or that we see the community not experiencing. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times as a student minister I would have a conversation with a parent of a, sometimes a freshman, a sophomore in college, and they would say, he or she never goes to church. I need you to make them go to church and make them, you know, be serious about their faith. I need you to do this for me. You know, just so worried that here I've raised this independent child who is able to think for himself or herself and we've instilled with them all these ideas of going and finding their own path and then when they start out on it, <gasps> wait a minute, come back. Come back, it's not safe out there. You might run into something that you don't know how to deal with it. Come back. I always said the same thing to those parents. Trust the investment that you have made in your child. Trust it. You have to let them go. It's a process that begins from birth is this constant letting go. I'm dealing with it all the time with an almost two-year-old. I want to do my own thing. You have to let them go. I remember as I was getting ready to go off to seminary, a minister came to me uh, from my hometown and, and he said to me, um, now, now Matt, I don't want you, when you go off to seminary, I don't want you to get out there and to learn too much and to lose that fire in your belly, that excitement that you have for the gospel. Don't get out there and do that. And uh, I realized later, maybe he was a little threatened by my going off to seminary because he hadn't done that. But I also know that, that in his mind that the heart and the head were mutually exclusive. You couldn't 
have both of those together. If you embrace learning and knowledge and, and engaging your faith in that way, it was to diminish what you felt in your spirit. And he was trying to pull me back towards just live out of that passion, live out of your emotion. You know, we're, I think, seeking to be the kind of community of faith, the kind of church that encourages all of our members to continue growing forward in their faith journey with God. We don't ever want people to say, okay, I've gotten to a very comfortable place in my faith journey. I'm going to just nail down a stake here and stop right here and I think I'll be good for the rest of my life. I think I'll stop growing. People do that all the time, but, but I have the sense that that's not what we are about here at First Baptist. It's so easy to stop growing and to want to stay where we are in our faith journey, but we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep trying to grow and leaning and moving towards expanding what we understand and how we understand it and how broadly it affects the ways that we live our life. You know, I think we've seen in our journey as a congregation that a lot of great things come when we decide to move from the commonly held norm towards, towards the journey that we have in us to live. We wouldn't have female ministers if this church hadn't done that once upon a time. We wouldn't have some of the deacons and some of the members that we do in our congregation if our church hadn't pursued that kind of journey. We wouldn't have made some of the strides in our community ministries if we hadn't done that sort of thing over the years. But we did and we're better for it. We're better for it because we pursued those things. When I think about this transition that's happening between Moses and Joshua... I think about the tendencies that the people of Israel and even Joshua could have had to get stuck right there. Moses was one of the greatest leaders that the people of Israel ever knew. I mean, he had just died, but he was already a living legend. And this is Moses that we're talking about. And Joshua, his assistant, has to step into those shoes. Can you imagine what a task that was for Joshua? I've heard about countless pastors who have had to come into a place and follow a legend. I, I've yet to run across a story where that worked well. The person immediately following that legend where it was just as good, if not better. I remember John Claypool saying one time, I wouldn't follow me. It just, it's hard to do. I imagine the people thought, well, he's no Moses. That Joshua, a young kid, he's no Moses. Moses, you know, Moses always stood like this when he held his staff. Maybe you ought to do, I, I just, there's something about you that's different that I don't like as much. You know, Moses was a lot better at talking about what we're going to do than you are. You need to work on, can you imagine what Joshua heard? We all have our Moses that we have to live Behind, And sometimes that might be the thing that causes us to get stuck. You see, Joshua's task wasn't to figure out how to be Moses. That was Moses' task. Joshua had to figure out how to be Joshua and let Moses be Moses. And the people had to embrace Joshua and let go of Moses. And that's part of the task that our graduates are embarking upon. That they have been on the journey that they've been on and will be on the journey of discovering who you are and who God has created you to be and what God has created you to do just like we're doing that as a community of faith and just as Joshua had to embrace what God had gifted and shaped him to do our graduates have to do those same things we all who go through milestones have to do those same things we have to move out into larger and more open spaces in which to do that kind of work. And, and remember as we go that, that maybe it's not so much about knowing certain things or doing things in an exact and certain way as it is about living our lives in a certain posture. 
always focused on God and what God is doing, trusting that even though there are things that we can't understand and maybe can't explain, that God is with us nevertheless. And I think God's words to Joshua could be for us today. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Follow the law and make your very being, your everyday life, live out of those things. Don't be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I think if we can trust that, if we can make that our direction, our bent, I think we've got a lot better chance of making it smoothly through those milestones than if things have to be in a certain way. I want to close with a story about Eugene Peterson, who's a well-known author and, and uh, pastor and teacher. And he talks about when he was about five years old, he was living in eastern Montana. And out there in the open lands, he would walk across this meadow to a barbed wire fence that bordered the edge of his property, there where a nearby farm was. And he'd watch a farmer named Leonard Storm plow his field. And the thing that Peterson wanted to do more than anything else is to climb up on that big green John Deere tractor and go for a ride. He's five years old. What five-year-old doesn't want to get up on a tractor? So one day he was standing there at this fence watching Leonard plow his field. And and the farmer was probably a a football field's length away from him. And he spotted little five-year-old Eugene standing there next to that barbed wire fence. And he stopped the tractor and he stood up on the seat of the tractor and he made strong waving motions with his arms for the boy to come. And Peterson says he's never seen anyone use gestures like that before. And to him, standing there, this little five-year-old boy at this fence, he said he looked sort of mean and angry. Uh, He said this man was large and he was kind of ominous in his bib with his straw hat on his head. And he could tell he was yelling at him, but because the wind was blowing so hard, he couldn't hear a thing that the man was saying And he figured he was probably where he shouldn't be, as five-year-old boys can be. So he turned, and feeling rejected, he left and went back to the house. And, And there's something you need to know, he says, about Leonard and Olga Storm. They were huge, forbidding Norwegians. They never smiled. They were stoic. And Peterson said they exuded a kind of thick Nordic gloom. You can imagine why he was a little scared But he said they were always in church on Sundays, always there on Sundays, always sitting in the back row with their son. And he said they were also wealthy. They were wealthy by the community's standards. And whenever they needed to raise money for something in the church, uh, as people would raise their hand and say they would contribute $10 or $20 or $50 or whatever, Leonard would always say, I'll make up the difference. I'll make up the difference. And... And one Sunday, uh, after this experience out in the field, um, Farmer Storm came over to, to Peterson after worship, and he said, Little Pete, little Pete, why didn't you come out in the field on Thursday and ride the tractor with me? Peterson told him, I, I didn't know I could have. I thought you were chasing me away. And he said, I I called for you to come. I waved for you to come. Why did you leave? He said, "I, I didn't know what you meant. And the farmer said, little Pete, what do you do when you want somebody to come to you? And the little boy raised his hand out and with one little finger, he motioned for him to come. And the farmer chuckled and he put his arm on his shoulder and he said, that's piddling, little Pete. That's piddling. Out on the farm, we do things big. Out on the farm, we do things big. 
We can't tell any of our graduates what their life will be like. We don't even know ourselves what our lives contain. We don't know the specifics. We don't know all of the details. But we do know one thing. I do know one thing. That what we need in this world is for them and for every one of us to live fully into the life that God is called and creating inside of us and to do that big. That's what this world needs. This world doesn't need little piddling. Come, let me tell you about Jesus and what Jesus is doing This world needs people of faith and congregations to stand up and to proclaim at the top of their voice, come, let me tell you what Christ is doing in my life and in our community of faith. This world needs us to do our faith big. Will you join with me as we continue to do our faith together? in this place. I hope so. I hope so. Amen and amen. Our hymn of opportunity is number 629, Be Strong in the Lord. If there is any decision that you would make as we stand and sing together, will you come? Let's stand. Thank you.